picks. May so, I have your attention, please? No. <laughs> I'd like to see if the sound of the clock is eight o'clock, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. Brown will be taking over once we uh, get the preliminaries under control. I'd like to this first of all welcome me. all of you to the college tonight. And uh, I'd like to first explain a little bit about how the format runs for those of you who are perhaps here for the first time. The college so, operates in a very quick manner. We have a brief period of announcements. <laughs> then our speaker speaks for about an hour or so. Then we have a question and answer period. And please ask questions during that time because after the question period you'll have a brief time of rebuttal where you can get up for up to five minutes and who and depending on the town be allotted by how many people speak but you'll have a chance to speak your mind during our infamous rebuttal period at the end of the night the speaker gets Brown the last to take over and introduce our speaker let's hear it for Brown Okay, uh, so without any further ado, we will hear from Howard Clark. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't see that. I've got, I've got some books here just to... Uh, there, there's a lot of them are mentioned on that page. Afterward, if you want to look at them, you see that they're what they are. But it's not important. I have uh, two comrades here, Victor and Tom. We do a lot together. They were anxious to come. I've been here a couple other times. In any case, my name is Howard Court. I'm originally from Cleveland. But I've been here for seven years. The topic, you know, is about Israel Palestine. Well, seven years ago, I was in Jerusalem on a tour and I got sick. And uh, so I had to go to the hospital. But I met a Palestinian guy by the name of Ibrahim. And he helped me a lot. And then he accompanied me back to this country. And uh, he's been a friend ever since. Actually, he was very anxious to come because he had a son who had been in Katrina in lost New Orleans, living on a bus. So he got he got a chance to go down and see his son. But anyway, um, I've been involved in this issue for really the last 12 years, but before that, most of my life. I, uh, I was in uh, Israel area in 1954 as a young guy. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and when I came back, I, I was taking a college course at Antioch College with Arthur Morgan. Arthur, do you know who Arthur Morgan was? Was he? Well, no, that was his son, I think, Ernest. Arthur Morgan was the first chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and he was my mentor during college. He was, he had already, he had left the TVA, and uh, he left the Antioch College presidency, and he came back to Yellow Springs, Ohio, and formed an organization to strengthen small communities and neighborhoods. So that was a big influence on me, but, and he, I took a tutorial with him. So when I came back, I told him I'd been there. I said, what should I do? He said, Howard, you just study, find out about it, and let me know what you figured out. <laughs> so I started to study, and I've been doing it ever since. At one time, I was going to go uh, permanently and work over there to try and help resolve the problems. But I got married, and I decided to... My wife said, Howard, why don't you get some American government experience first? So I worked for New York State for over 30 years in the Department of Labor. Uh, I retired in, 60, in 96, and in the year 2001, um, December, I came across an article in uh, 
Daedalus a magazine, a series of articles about different solutions to this problem. And I said to myself, I know other solutions in addition. So maybe we could get a compendium of solutions so that we'd know all the different options. So I started working on that. But the reason I thought to do that was it was actually Arthur Morgan, who I just mentioned. He was perhaps the leading hydraulic engineer in the world. One of them, anyway. Well, when he was in his 80s, he had been retired. He heard, he got a distress call from the Seneca Indians in western New York State. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers were planning to build a, a dam to protect Pittsburgh, but it would have inundated the, the reservation and destroyed their thousand-year-old uh, burial ground. So it was an important matter to them. Another engineer had been there and he couldn't do much and he got sick. So Morgan went up, I think he did it pro bono, but he studied the thing, he looked at all the angles, and he came up with an alternative plan. It would have diverted the water from uh, into Lake Erie and Erie, Pennsylvania, would have prevented the flooding of the reservation, would have cost less, and it would, and I don't know, something else. But anyway, but the Army Corps of Engineers was set on what they were going to do. They had made plans, they had spent money already, so they fought the thing. But there were people like me all over the country who were friends of Morgan, and we wrote to, the, I wrote to the Albany Times Union, other people wrote elsewhere, and we tried to uh, help them, but it went to Congress. Congress decided that the Army Corps of Engineers should win, and they did. The reservation was flooded, the grave stones were destroyed, and uh, that's what happened. But, you know, it doesn't have to work that way every time. And the principle I learned from that was the perhaps the main thing about Morgan's philosophy was on important policy decisions, you look at all the options. So when, when I uh, saw that, you know, the Israel-Palestine thing wasn't being solved and people are coming up with ideas, I said, why? Don't we look at all the options and not not get stuck in any one option? So, I can't and right as a matter of fact, in 2004, I brought a proposal to the United Nations Association in New York to to have a compendium of approaches. Well, it had passed, but no money was ever allocated and nothing was ever done about it. So I, I keep working on it, nevertheless. Um, <clears throat> so in 2008, I wrote a, a draft paper that was on the internet, if you looked it up and you still can afterward, called Alternative Approaches to Israeli-Palestinian Coexistence. It also, you can find it under the internet under Political Approaches to Coexistence, or PACO. Paco means peace in Esperanto, incidentally. Um, so, um, and then I've given a, two other presentations. This is once in Israel and once in Oakland. But this is the first time locally, and I appreciate this chance very much. Because I think we're at a point now that maybe what I'm talking about will make more sense than it did in the past. Why? Because if you talk to Israelis and Palestinians and many Americans, you tell them what you're trying to do and they'll say, oh, there'll never be a solution. You know, have you heard that before? I think you have. A lot of people say there's no solution. Well, Victor said that to me too. But now he's here, he wants to hear. I appreciate it, Victor. Um, so we're at a point, you know, almost of uh, no, re I mean, you can't get any worse. It, it's 12, 14 years since uh, Oslo and nothing has happened. 
There's been great plans proposed, but either sometimes one side, sometimes the other, say no, and they uh, dig in and don't allow anything to be done. So I think that maybe, you know, and we've been stuck with this idea of the two-state solution. It's a great thing if it could work, but I would say that 90% of the experts in this field now feel that it cannot work. And why? Well, one of the reasons was suggested a week ago at the University of Chicago. They had a symposium, and there was a guy by the name of Myanmar. He was, he's head of the Jerusalem Fund, a community development project over there, a Palestinian. He lives in Israel, but he's a Palestinian. He said, they have the two-state solution work, and you probably would need to remove 100,000 settlers from the West Bank. They're now 400, 450,000. You obviously couldn't remove them all, but in a negotiated settlement, maybe the proposal would come up, remove 100,000. Well, according to this guy, the amount of money that would it cost to uh, relocate these people uh, in money and in homes, transportation, everything, would be something like over 15% of the Israeli gross national product. He said they are never going to do that. So. Regardless of ideology, even if they did want to, and I'm not sure they do, but even if they did, the cost would be so great. So increasingly, Palestinians, some Israelis, some Americans and elsewhere, are beginning to think that maybe a one-state solution is the answer. But before I uh, deal with that, now that sheet I passed out um, is really just to give a general picture of what, what I'm going to do. I'm not going to touch on everything, and I've, most things I'll just touch on very lightly. But that'll give you something if you want to go further into those issues. Uh, there's a tremendous literature in this field, and just, just the question of proposals is the how to solve it. I spent several years looking them up, and they, I didn't get them all. There are others. People have written plans in Scandinavia, in other places, and I would like to see all of those plans brought forward. And that's something I'm going to say at the end. See, I, if we could get funding for this, we could unearth those plans, we could send people, look at the bottom of that sheet, it says elsewhere. There's eight or ten places in the world that have similar conflicts to Israel-Palestine. Belgium, Cyprus, Ireland, Malaysia, South Africa, the Basque country, other places. But, you know, you could learn things from them. There's a guy here in Chicago, Ali Abu Nima, he's a, one of the leading Palestinian spokesmen. He went and visited uh, at length in Ireland and South Africa. But another place that would be interesting to go would be Cyprus. You know, the Greeks and the Turks have been fighting there, but <coughs> for the last 10 years approximately, there have been almost no violence. That doesn't mean they're friends, but at least they're not killing each other. So what is the reason for that? How, why, is there anything we could learn from any of those places? Or from any of these proposals? Um, I think there are little points in different proposals that are great, and it might even be possible to combine some of them in a solution. But not if we're stuck on either a one-state solution or one form, of, I, mean, I mean a two-state solution or one, a form of a one-state. We've got to look broader and not make up our minds. Let's. I'd like out of this to have, hopefully, some other people will join in this search to try and find a solution. It's an important problem, and maybe world peace depends on it. So if any of you would like to work on this further, we just formed this organization called PACO, Political Approaches to Coexistence. We'd be glad to have any help.
possible. And maybe we can make some dent. We won't solve it, but maybe we can uh, make a little step ahead and get the information to the decision makers over there, maybe broaden their perspective, and then they'll have to deal with it. So maybe we can help broaden their perspective. Well, anyway, on this sheet here, you know, the first section, I just wanted to point out that uh, you get a book for Israel, you got one against it. So it's a bitterly drawn struggle. Uh, I'm not going to take any sides right now. But uh, if you want to know more about it, that's a good place. Now, the second item there is two states. Um, Yibish, who's a leading Palestinian guy in Washington, he wrote that in reaction to Ali Abu Lima's uh, thing under one state, one country. Um, they're, they know each other. They used to be friends. I don't know if they are anymore. But they have different views as to what would be the solution. Um, and Susser even brings Jordan into it, but basically a two-state plan. Now, under D, under social, shared homeland, I bet you haven't heard of either of those per two people. I'll tell you who I, I knew about them. Well, I knew Esther Riley because Someone brought me in touch with She lives in, uh, outside of San Francisco. She's been working on this for years. And she has an idea in which, it's called condominium. I don't know what condominium, why they call it that exactly, but the idea is that both people could live on the same land and they'd have two different parliaments. The Palestinian parliament would deal with domestic and certain issues for the Palestinians, and the Jewish parliament would do it for those. Now, many things would have to be done jointly, let's say traffic regulations or sanitation. So they'd have to work that out, but it would allow a degree of autonomy for both sides. And she has that, and she isn't the only one, and it's really the name of Kedar, and a group in Sweden are now studying variations of this proposal. Um, the other person there is a guy, Jansson Kirsch. Believe it or not, he's from Norway. And he, uh, in Israel, they, they had a, uh, a contest open to Palestinians and Israelis for the best plan. He came down from Norway, and I studied all the plans that they came up with. His is one of the best. Uh, and he keeps developing it, he keeps changing it, but originally the idea was that you would have um, an Israeli section, a Palestinian section, and then a third section, a shared homeland. And people would, would uh, the ones in the shared ho homeland would be progressives, you know, people who wanted to live and join together. The others are the people who wanted to stay with their own group mostly. But you'd have to choose allegiance to, or citizenship in one, but you could live anywhere. So residency would be cha would be separated from citizenship. He's got a whole plan worked out on that. Recently, he, he developed just how these things change. He then he now talks about a four unit. Uh, a shared homeland adjacent to Israel and a shared homeland adjacent to Palestine. For instance, in the, in the Jewish section, under his plan, 96% would be Jews. So they wouldn't have to worry about being overridden by the greater birth rate of Palestinians. The Palestinian side would have a majority of their people. Um, and the other features to it, and as I say, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. You can really do it if you want to. Uh, but they they are come out because of this contest. I was there earlier, the same organization, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Research Institute. I was there a few years ago, and I gave a little talk about this. and. There were nobody from Gaza, but there were quite a few from the West Bank and Israelis, and they 
you know, we were eating lunch together, joking and going out in the sun together. But of course, you know, the Israelis are the ones with power. The Palestinians don't have it, that they at least like the chance that they could interact with this way. Anyway, going on to the next one, one state, there is a growing feeling among intellectuals and others that maybe one state would be a prefer, you know, a preferred solution. But on that point, I would say that the devil is in the details. What kind of one state? You know, you can have one state, let's say in South Africa, they have one person, one vote. Uh, and that's one way of doing it. I hear things, there's a lot of problems still there, but anyway, that's one way of doing it. At least you have human rights. Another way would be to um, have a decentralized system in which you can have people of one group living in one area and, and in another area. And the degree of control from the center could vary. It could be a great deal or it could be very little. They could have veto power under circumstances, or maybe not. But, um, and there are different variations. I think that's where the real study needs to be done. For, and because, and I forgot to mention this earlier, really, um, my goal on this is that out of this will come uh, safe, secure, safety and security for both peoples with guarantees against majority domination and equal rights for all. That's my goal. And I think you could do that. I think you could have a Jewish homeland and a Palestinian homeland, and yet they would have a unity, and they could even eventually serve in the same army, peace corps, or whatever. But it has to be done, for instance, we have uh, the Senate and the House in this country, don't we? I mean, that gives a chance for lesser populated areas to have some say, but also gives strong say for majority areas. Well, that, that could be one of the features. But there could be administrative features also that would allay the fears. Now, you know, Jewish fears are pretty great, even now, based on what happened in Europe. But in some people wrongly accuse the Arabs of just being continuation. Well, there were one or two, but as a whole, the Arabs were not. In fact, in Paris, there's a mosque, the central mosque, that sheltered Jews during the Holocaust. And I found out about that at the last annual Holocaust uh, uh, meeting downtown in one of the hotels last year. I have a book on it. So, yeah, there was the Grand Mufti, who was a friend, of, a friend of Hitler's, but you can't generalize that to the Arab world. The Palestinians are very fearful, too. They've been treat, treated rottenly. They're sorties into their country, and uh, people going on hunger fast. So they're, they're fearful also. So, we have to have guarantees, but I'll tell you this, at this conference last week, and several of us were there, um, the, um, this guy Pitnik, Plitnik, he uh, was one of the founders of Jewish Voice for Peace. He made the point that, you know, the Israeli institutions are already established. Let's say the Arab birth rate was greater as it is, and in 10, 15 years from now, there might be 55% Palestinian, 45% Jewish. Well, to most Jews, and, and, and uh, particularly in this country, and lots in Israel, that would be a catastrophe. It would be the end of the world. But according to him, and he's Jewish, and traditional Jewish, he said, even if the Palestinians got a slight edge in population, the institutions of the country would still be there. And the populations would be very close. It wouldn't be like in Europe where the Jews were 600,000 among 70 million in Germany. It'd be very close. And it, 
according to his judgment, the Israelis would not have to fear, even if the Palestinians got a slight numerical advantage. They couldn't ch change many of the institutions. They're already there. Well, that could be argued. But um, the basic point that I'm making is that we need to search for ways to guarantee that no minority will be dominated by a majority. And that's where I hope some of you would also get in on this. Let's figure out. And very few people are doing that. Most everybody talks about one state, one person, one vote in South Africa. But that isn't the only way it could be done. It could be done in, in various other ways. And I think a, a real search on this could make a difference. Any case going on, um, now this last section here, you know, these are some prime people. <coughs> Joe Avinsar is a well-to-do, successful attorney in Los Angeles. He, he was an Israeli, he went there, and now he's putting all his money into forming uh, a, feder a confederation. What his, exam what his thing is, they divided up Israel-Palestine into 300 units. And they held an election last December. And whoever was elected, whether an Israeli, a Palestinian, or a Chi Chinese person, whoever was elected was the representative. Um, and they were going to have, they will have, rotating president. And any, any idea that they come across could be vetoed by either or both parliaments, the Knesset in Israel or the Palestinian Authority, plus any bill would have to pass by 55%. So uh, what they, they're trying to find things that really unify people, and if the people in power really can't take it, they can veto it. Anyway, it was to be a start. Well, I'll have to be honest, the, the vote in December was, was weak. Not every district even fielded a candidate, but some did, and I don't know, I hope Joe isn't so discouraged that he gives up on it, uh, but uh, for instance, the opposition he faced was like this, some Palestinians said, we don't want to normalize this situation, we're not going to participate, and they have their reasons for saying that. Israelis say, what is this? This is a joke. It doesn't mean anything. They boycotted it. But some people went into it and ran for office, and I hope that Joe keeps up. I'm trying to encourage him. I sent him 300 bucks right at the end when it was a crisis, because he, he couldn't get airtime. I hope he keeps up. Um, Jimmy Carter, He's got more of a traditional plan. It's been proven now by intractability, sometimes from both sides, or from that it's not going to work. It's more or less the general two-state plan, the swapping of territory and other dimensions. But it was an, if we would have had a greater deal of, good, of goodwill, it might have been possible. Maybe it still is. Um, Dave Gavron is a, a, a Britisher who emigrated to Israel 40 years ago. And he's written several books for reconciliation and peace. That book there has got, uh, in capital letters, Mosaic, he's got dozens of examples of Israelis, Palestinians working together. Um, you know, they're small, they don't amount to a lot, but they're spreading every year in different places. And if you get, you know, who knows, an eventual grassroots movement might get, someday get strong enough to influence decision makers. There's a, there's a couple by the name of Len and Libby Troutman. He's a retired dentist. They've been working for years to bring forward all the places in this country and elsewhere where dinner groups and all kinds of meetings, and they just, if you look that up, uh, Leonard and Lil Troutman, they just had a thing on the internet with all kinds of joint musical things and economic development things, and 
so on. It's, it, it's, they're really indefatigable, you know, they just keep going. Jeff Halper was from the same town in Minnesota as, who is that, the great, Bob Dylan, remember him? A small little town in, in Minnesota, he became an anthropologist. He's over there now, and um, he's, he thinks there should be a two states. It's two stages. One, uh, two states with Israel probably much dominant, but eventually growing into a regional confederation. And I hear his recent thinking is to try to do things on a cultural basis, which incidentally is similar to Lerner. Lerner, one of his, the end of his book, he says, if I had my way, we would have no state. Yes. We, we would divide it up into bioregions, environmental bioregions, yeah. that would relate to the environment. Well, if you combine that with cultural regions, but of course, the real world will prevent it right now, but at least that's something in people's <laughs> minds, maybe to work toward that. Um, I wanted to, you know, I've got all these books here, but one in particular I just want to show you. Because I think it's uh, particularly valuable. It's called Embracing Israel Palestine by Michael Lerner. He's a rabbi in Berkeley, California. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his organization, Tikkun, and something about spiritual, something. They have a whole idea of a worldwide Marshall Plan, all kinds of ideas. And at his conferences, the rabbis and the nuns are dancing together. I mean, it's a... I can't dance, so I wasn't in on it, but a lot of those people did. And, you know, that's fellowship being built. And he's got on his board a, a, a nun, a Protestant minister and himself, the three of them. But, you know, some people will say he's a pansy. He doesn't strongly enough attack Israel. Well, if you look through his points, one of his points is reduce the influence of APEC. No, he doesn't say that everything that Israel does is wrong, but the 20 are and they're the dominant factor, but he's trying to see both sides, <coughs> which I think is really great. So there'll be people who say this is namby-pamby, and there are others who will say it's too much one side, too much the other, but that's one of the books that's really attempting to have a bridge. Now, I don't know, how long have I been talking? Oh, you, you got you got plenty of time. We can go to. It's only quarter to nine, so. All right. Well, there's another book I want to show you here. Um, here, this one. Pardon? There's a clock right up there. Oh, clock. Yeah. It. How long do I have? Do you think? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Nine fifteen. All right. All right. I I dedicated that paper I wrote, which I'm now trying to revise. To Judah Magnus. I don't have any of you ever heard of him? A few. I'm surprised. I mean, very few people have, but in around 1920, he was a very prominent American rabbi. And not only that, he was a progressive. He had been a pacifist in World War I. And in all types, he had cooperated with John, I think, well, various leading Protestant ministers. But then, in around 1925, he went overseas and he became the first chancellor of the Hebrew University, um, which he was, he was there until 1948. But his main activity was to bring Jews and Arabs together. And he worked countless hours. He and Martin Buber and a few others formed a group called Ehud for Unity. And they published a, um, a brochure, a pamphlet, a, a periodical in all three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and English. Um, and at the United Nations in 1947, they proposed a binational state. Um, but they were, they were shouted down by both sides. 
And even though the people in the UN favored what they said, the intensity of, of hostility to it on both sides prevented it from getting anywhere. But he's been an inspiration. He and Martin Buber and Saeed, the Palestinian, what is Saeed's first name? Does anybody remember? Edward Saeed. Edward Saeed. They all are very similar views. And they're inspirations to people on both sides. And not only the people from one side. A lot of Jews are very favorable to Saeed. And I think a lot of Palestinians see value in some of these Jewish leaders. But, um, you know, I, well, there's two other sections there. The bottom I already mentioned about different places. You know, if we can get this movement going, even to eventually get some funding, if we got a million dollars, we could send people to each of these countries and report on them. We could do other things. We could examine all the un unarticulated plans that are now laying around in different places and bring them all forward and categorize them. Um, and, but, okay, the, the, I think, uh, Prophet, um, I talked about the magnets. Do we have those right papers over there where they're going to pass out? Excuse me, I gave you a pile of paper. I, I know I can talk a little longer, but I'm going to... Yeah. Uh, can we pass these around? I, I, I could talk longer, but I think I've talked enough. Um, in addition to Magnus, this is another prophet. He just died four or five days ago. I met him. They uh, took me across the border into Palestine. He's the leader of a Jewish settlement in the West Bank. But in contrast to most of the Israelis in the West Bank, he has very close relations, or he had, with Palestinians. He was a friend of Arafat. He, he knows the Hamas people. And he's been a, an inspiration. Uh, I mean, he's an Orthodox, too. He's a very uh, traditional. But he's got uh, the guy who promotes him to me is Ibrahim, my Palestinian friend. Um, You'll see on the second page of that, two of his disciples, a Palestinian and an Israeli, are now planning to form the first farm in the West Bank, joint farm, as a, uh, to hit an honor of his legacy. So there are other prophets like that, and there are others scattered around the world, and plenty within Palestine. And, and Israel and here. So what I, I'm going to end this just by saying my goal is, as I said, uh, a safe, secure place for both peoples with guarantees that there'll be no domination by one over the other and that there will be equal human rights for all. And my goal here is that hopefully some of you will join with us who are already working on this and try to examine all the alternatives and look into the details and maybe make a contribution to resolving this problem which could become a world conflagration if we don't do it. So I want to thank you for the chance to express this and uh, be glad to talk or hear any questions or comments. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you've obviously studied this issue quite a bit. I'd like to get your views on what would be considered the Gaza free trade zone. Much like Shanghai that have free trade and have boomed, couldn't you see the same thing happen for Gaza? Yeah. As a matter of fact, the people in Stero, you know, the Jewish village or city right across from the Gaza border, in contrast to many others, they outreach, they want to become friends with the Gazans. And I don't know if they're going to be able to, but 
You know, in El Paso, Texas, in conjunction with Juarez, Texas, they have a Joint Economic Development Commission. Mexico. But what if we had a Sterobe Gaza or Gaza City Joint Economic Development Commission? And there is, there's a man from Wisconsin who's head of Canaan Free Trade. Well, I agree, and to keep Gaza so isolated is terrible, as from my point of view. And I think, I think they have a lot to offer if they could be brought into the mainstream. Yes, sir. Did you? Yes. Uh... Yes. So, in uh, 1989, with the fall of the old Soviet Union, uh, there were a great number of Jewish uh, Soviet citizens who emigrated to Israel. What, if any, effect did that have on the situation regarding Palestine and uh, Israel? Yeah. It hasn't been great, to be honest. It, it, uh, of course, the million or so uh, Soviets who moved there, Frankly, about a fifth of them weren't Jewish. They, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, a lot, many of them are very conservative. And uh, um, they're afraid, you know, they're afraid of things that could happen. They have relatives living in settlements. We have a guy where I live who uh, was really outraged when I, he heard my views. He's got a, he's got some, cousins who live in a, a settlement that's very uh, precarious. But, yeah, I'm far away. I, I don't have to deal with those things daily, but if you have an overriding philosophy, you, you don't jump on every bad thing that happens and consider it always going to happen. But um, a lot of the uh, Russians went into the right-wing parties, and Quite a few of the Middle Eastern Jews, Mizrahi, from the, did also. But why? Part of the reason is that they felt discriminated against against by the Ashkenazi. You know, the uh, Israel is primarily a Polish, German, Russian influenced society, and with many prejudices against people from the Middle East, Africa. And elsewhere, and they they still feel that they're well. They're not in as bad a situation as Arabs, but they're all, they're certainly lower on the totem pole. So I think irrationally, a lot of them went into these right wing parties. But I think there's a possibility they could be pulled out of there. And this new guy who was elected. Uh, who's focusing on domestic issues, not elected, he's number two under, uh, next to Netanyahu. He's forcing the Israelis to begin dealing with domestic issues. And that, the Mizrahi, the Middle Eastern Jews are, are prime people who are living under terrible conditions because of that. For instance, young people, and this it would also go for uh, Ashkenazi young people, very few of them can afford a house or even an apartment. They live with their parents. The housing situation is terrible. Um, and there are other, you know, Israel put so much of its money into, into protect security that it has neglected social issues. And the disparity in income in Israel is not almost as bad as this country. And that's saying quite a bit. And it didn't used to be. It used to be much more egalitarian. But, uh, so some of these, you know, there's a man today who spoke, I didn't go, Lawrence Langley. Did anybody see him at the, uh, that other group? Pardon? Let's go to another question. Yes, all right. Oh, okay. um, I saw Charles first. Yeah. All right, Howard. The settlers in, invaded Indian land. The Russians invaded my homeland, Lithuania. The Chinese invaded Tibet. And then you show up and say, oh, let's talk about coexistence. Well, that's all fine and well, 
if you haven't been invaded. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, would, what would be the answer? What do you... Don't invade. <laughs> well, that's the first thing. But once it's done, what, what do you do then? If you weren't here before, maybe you shouldn't be here now. Oh. So when are you going back to Lithuania, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh I'm, I'm being facetious. Yes. Yeah, as a yeah. matter of fact, what is this a thing? You show up. How, how many like thousand years comes before? Let's yeah. stick on the one thing. It's a bad thing. Chinese show up. What would you do? I'd really like to know what you would tell the Tibetans Chinese. Well, you know, I'm not a specialist in Tibet or anything, but I believe there's some arguments on both sides, even though I favor the Tibet side, but I think the Chinese have some arguments. But <coughs> they would have to be willing to sit down with, um, who is the great spiritual leader there in Tibet? The Dalai Lama. He's in Dalai Lama. He would love to sit down with some degree of use of, the microphone of, of power, but they, the Chinese won't do it. But who knows if they'll always not do it? If there's enough pressure around the world, maybe they'll eventually work out some arrangement. I mean, Hong Kong. I don't know. They eventually worked out an arrangement there. Taiwan, at least they aren't killing each other. They're, it would be possible, once you can sit down and talk, um, but the burden is on those with power. They have to be the ones who are really willing to talk and share some power and be willing to let the other guy have almost an equal pedestal with him. By the way, my father was born in what was Gedrovitz in Lithuania. I went there in 1986 and looked for the town. Nobody could tell me where it was. <laughs> but, but finally, uh, a big tall guy said, Gedrovitz, get, oh, Gedrovitz, Gedrovitz. The name had changed. And, but then, then I, they wouldn't allow me to go there. Why? At that time, we had disputed areas, both in this country and over there, where you couldn't go, for instance, you couldn't go to Buffalo, New York if you were a Soviet. I couldn't go to this area. But at the time I was working for New York State for Mario Cuomo, you know, and he was thinking of running for president. So I wrote a, a, a memo to the head of the, in the hotel upstairs. I said, I'm part of the staff of Mario Cuomo. That was a little expanded statement, but anyway, Plus the fact that my uh, father grew up there, and he's 96. He, I've got to get back and tell him I visited his town. So the man uh, said, well, Mr. Court, why don't you go downstairs, and I'll see what I can do. Ten minutes later, somebody came up, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, okay, we have a car and a guide. You can go there for two hours. I said, no, I need three hours at a minimum. So believe it or not, the Soviet Empire decided to give me three hours instead of two. So I went there with a guy uh, and uh, I saw the town my, where my father lived is now a um, forestry station. They live ne ne across from the jail. We asked some woman with a babushka, an old lady, you know, where was the jail? She said, oh, up there, you know. Anyway, I, and by the way, by the way, uh, the Lithuanian Museum sponsored a program last year, a Jewish speaker and a Lithuanian speaker. The Jewish speaker told about the Holocaust in Lithuania, which was very bad, but not everything. The Lithuanian speaker told about the terrible misdeeds that the Soviets did for the Lithuanian population, sending hundreds of thousands of them into Siberia, Kazakhstan, etc. So the two women shared the platform. And Excuse me, the Jewish was not Lithuanian? 
They were, but they were in many ways a separate culture. Yeah, what, what about the Special Lithuanian SS battalions? Lithuania was not the best of the countries in relation to the Holocaust at all. But there were exceptions, and we've got to go forward. And they were trying to show that both populations had been terribly wrong. And I think that's true, but it'll be years before they'll be reconciled. Uh, I, I, I'm not an authority on that, and I know a lot was terrible that happened there, but we've got to go forward. I, I had a friend in New York State who brought together a grandson, a granddaughter of an SS man and a Holocaust uh, second or third generation on a platform at, in uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. They spent the evening talking, and, the, you know, Maybe you be, can begin to break, and I want to tell you one other thing. I live at uh, the Kenwood, which is a senior facility, and I met a guy there by the name of Joe Behrens, a guy that I liked tremendously, and we got along. I finally found out he was in the Wehrmacht during the Second World War, and he was wounded in Russia and spent eight months in hospital, but believe it or not, at the end of the war, the, the German government sent him to university, because he couldn't obviously fight, but he emigrated to this country. I, I put it in your pocket, and I consider him one of the greatest friends I ever had in my life. He, he was 18 when he was pulled into the army and he didn't want it. Sure, he probably could have risked his life and said no, but he, he spent a great life. What I'm just saying is things that happen aren't persistent. Sometimes you can reconcile. That's what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And that's what Lerner proposes for here. Some d deeds cannot be totally forgiven. But, and they can't, certainly can't be forgotten. But maybe it can go forward. Figure out ways to go forward. Okay, um, all right, I have a question. Uh, you propose, you mentioned a lot of different possible solutions to the Israeli-Palestinian yeah. conflict uh, that were proposed by different people. But one thing you haven't talked about is who would implement any of these solutions. I think that question. What? This is a question. Who would implement them? You take the question. He, who would implement? Yeah. Who would implement any of these solutions? How could they be implemented? Could they be? Implemented? Who, who would do it? Who are the parties? Well, one of the parties is people like us. Yeah. Oh. If yeah. You pressure. Right. Okay, except that we don't we don't do it because it's it's not up to us because it's not all of you Americans here. It's not our country. It's 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 Israel. But do you you realize how strong the lobbies are in this country? In particular, the APAC lobby. Well, but who over who is actually going to implement this over there? Who But part of the problem is in this country. If if you have unanimity on one side. You're not going to get fairness, and you're not going to move ahead. So, and this country has a big influence. If Obama felt more secure electorally in other ways, he might be more of an advocate who could do something. But in New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, to some extent Illinois, California, the Jewish vote is very high. And these people want to keep their seats. And the Palestinian uh, lobby has been very weak up until now. Okay, well, let's see why we're here. All right, all right, let me ask you, all right, let me ask you this. Suppose... Louder, Don. All right, well... It seems like I Don wants to have like some conversation down there. Uh, look, now, exactly, do you, you expect that the, uh, do you expect that this would involve some kind of negotiation with uh, the in Israel? 
It would have to. Okay, now who would exactly Israel negotiate with? Well, the, that's one of the problems. The Palestinians are divided in at least two ways now. Hamas and Palestinian Authority. And then there's a whole Palestinian diaspora. And they say, what are you guys doing all this without consulting with us? In, in Chicago, there are 70,000 Palestinian refugees. They want to say in this. Um, so I think one of the things is the Palestinians have got to get together so that they can have a unified negotiation. And we have to stop when Hamas won an election. What year was it? 2006? We, we abrogated that election and didn't allow them to take office. Now, whether we like them or not, that was against our principles, of, at least on paper, of allowing the democracy to occur. And, and I think a lot of things retrogressed ever since. I don't know, maybe the Gazans would have, you know, ruined everything, but on the other hand, if they're brought into power, sometimes people brought into power become a little more moderate. At least that's my thought, anyway. Yeah, are, are people from Israel and Palestine, are they sending emissaries throughout the whole world telling people, we want people from the whole world to come to our countries, Israel and Palestine, yes. stick their noses in and tell us Israelis and Palestinians how we're supposed to live. And if not, how come people much. from all over the world are trying to stick their nose in and tell them how to live? Well, first of all, they don't like as a whole people from the outside pushing their way in. Maybe they don't even like what I'm doing. But what I'm doing, and others like me, is we're just trying to articulate the options. They are the decision makers. For what reason? Peace. Why didn't you go there and hey, tell the people? Hey, come on. Like, no. Shut up, Frank. You shut up. Why didn't you go there and live there and tell the people, shit that you you're going to tell them how to live? Here. And if they don't do what you tell them to, then to you're the going to get an army to kill spring. them. He's a nice <laughs> man. He's not... But I, I think that would be a negative, that would be a backward step. They've got to come to this themselves, and maybe we can help why, them. Why don't all these other people shut up? Why do you have to shut up? <laughs> all right. Will you allow why are you sticking your Mr. nose in? Will you my, allow the my, speaker to he's the chair. <laughs> You're not the chair, Mike. He's can having I too much fun screaming. Can I stick my nose screaming. in his lecture? No, you can't. Like he wants to not my screaming, God damn it! Shut up! Once and for all. Raise your hand. One rule at a time, right? <laughs> Fucking shit. Go clean up the Pacific Ocean. God damn it. Raise your hand. Like this. This, 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 why are all these people people getting trying to run Israel and Palestine? <laughs> when <laughs> half of them never even oh, been there. Right. You have to divide up uh, people. There are Jews who are going there because they consider it their homeland. It's a spiritual, religious thing. And, but there are not that many who come from the United States, but some do. Um, not too many. Well, I've got a Palestinian friend by the name of Mazim Kumsia who taught at Yale in genetics for 20 years. And he worked on this problem, but four or five years ago he went back to his village. And he teaches at uh, two Palestinian universities, and he's an activist for Palestine. But he, he came, now would you stop him from going back? He wanted to help his country. He wanted to help his fellow Palestinians. Who am I to stop him from doing that? God damn it, what if... Who would you ask me if I would stop him? Who am I to stop him? Okay. You're not. Okay, then why did you ask me about what? No, no. I can't kill you. Can you speak louder? If you don't have... All right, mate. Someone else's turn now. Let's go oh, by. Yes. All right. Um, you try to coexist, Mike. <laughs> First of all, uh, uh, very, very I commend you for, for your good will. Hey, let, let her speak, please. Uh, and I do think that Palestine 
and Israel need intervention very, very from the outside. I don't think that the conflict will will get anywhere from inside. So yes, they do need it. And I'm you know, I have Israeli citizenship and American citizenship. My you question, have one? I, I was born and raised in Israel. Right. Um, my question is obviously you recognize that the issue is not tactics, the issue is not like engineering issue like how to build a bridge it's very uh, it has to do with attitudes it has to do with religion with beliefs with emotions uh, I didn't hear what how do you suggest and you mentioned fears but that's a very complex issue too fear fear yeah, yeah. Um, it seems to me that that is the obstacle. How do you offer to deal with those obstacles? Well, there, for instance, have you heard of the community called Neve Shalom? Yeah. You probably know a lot more about it than I do, but there are at least 200 people there, about half Arab and half Israel, and they live together, their school is together, they do it, you know, they're an integrated community. So, getting to know, now I had an argument with, with a guy by the name of Paul this afternoon. He said that the key is legislation. You, you know, and if somebody does something, you send him to jail if he does something wrong. Well, you do need legislation. We certainly needed civil rights legislation. But in addition, you need uh, pilot projects of people working together and becoming acquainted. And, Gavron illustrates that there are dozens of these projects you don't hear about it. You hear in the paper about killings, but there's a parents of, of deceased children who, from both people, who meet regularly and um, help each other get through it. Those are, you know, you have to work on different levels, That's your I think. Yes, sir. Okay. Why is the Israeli Broadcast Authority English language news so boring? <laughs> well, Jews were never known as good jokesters. <laughs> Where? <laughs> well, I just, I just did a dud right there. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but you know, uh, Al Jazeera, the Palestinian. Egyptian, no, Egyptian, Egyptian. Is, is, is improving its quality and competing with BBC now. But um, I, I want them to talk in Esperanto. Yeah. Al Jazeera was founded by a couple of ex-CNN executives. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. Well there's a million people in the world who speak it. Why can't we have that the dominant language? Uh. Seven billion other people. What I'm. I know, but uh, was it a Jew who, who was one of the founders of it? I think. Yeah. We, yeah. Always. Well, anyway, but it, that's an attempt. Sokolov. What? Sokolov. Yeah, I mean that's an attempt toward you know lots of people in all kinds of areas are making attempts to a better world, but. A few of them succeed and most fail, but people tell, you know, um, if you heard of uh, Yuri Avneri, you've heard of him. He's one of the leading Israeli peaceniks, but he came, and he's about 85, so he's been working at it a long time. But he, he recently wrote an article and said, what do you mean a binational state? They never work. Look at all the problems in Belgium. Look at Ireland, at least till recently. Look at uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. None of these places ever work. What are they fooling with it? Two-state solution, that's it. Well, I wrote Lerner, he's going to put an article in. Even if they didn't work, does that mean we stopped working on it? We, we look and find why they didn't work. And what could be done? You take the good and disperse, get rid of the bad. Maybe the next one will work. And it's worth it. Isn't this a, a cause that's worth putting some energy in? I think so. 
look at the United well, States, <laughs> Yanks and, and rebels, I don't know, just terrible. I'm sure my friends are in the back of me there. We have another question. We've got some more questions, surely. Yes, Russ. What are you going? How are you going to deal with when you have groups of radicals on both sides, the Hamas and, and the radical settlers? and the other radicals that have views similar to them. You know, you know even, that, even they might change. I have heard that within Hamas, there are some that are more radical than others. And of course, in the recent negotiations that went on, Israel pulled what I consider a terrific faux pas. The guy who was leading the Hamas negotiations, they assassinated. You assassinate just the guy who happens to be stepping out to, to try to negotiate. Boy, what a faux pas that was. How can you negotiate with people who were firing rockets on you? Do you know what the ratio of rockets into Israel against Israel firepower into Gaza? I mean, the rockets into Israel is terrible, but the Israeli rockets kill 15 to every one that Israeli, and they and they the firepower going into Gaza is 20, 30, 50, 100 times greater. So we have to concentrate on both, stop both of them. But the people in Sterot, right next to Gaza, say we want to become friends. They send delegation. And they're the ones who are being bombed. They're doing it more than the people in Tel Aviv or, or Haifa. I mean, you know, these horrible things happen, but we have, one evil doesn't abrogate another. They're, sometimes the first evil leads to a greater second one, I think, or a third. Syria, where they want to, it's all ethnic they, they want, and it's, you know, and how will them impose on a peace with Israel and Palestine? Well, the Shiite-Sunni uh, conflict is almost as uh, horrendous as the Israeli-Palestinian. And Israel is very worried of what's happening there, but they're also doing some thinking about what they might do about it, and I think we, all we can do is try to help bring them together, but they're going to have to do it themselves. We can help, maybe, but, I, I, you know, I'm not a specialist about Syria. I don't know that much. I know that it's a, t a terrible thing, and uh, that's another part of the world that's got to be healed. Okay, right behind you, Charlie. Oh. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, how do you feel about the situation in Iran? Iran. Iran. Uh, Iran. Uh, particularly nuclear weapons. Uh, do you think Iran's going to get them? Uh, do you think that the, the U.S. or Israel should attack or prevent it? Uh, what do you think would happen if they did? And what do you think will happen if Iran does get nuclear weapons? <coughs> will it affect the situation? You know, you can't predict these things. In politics, particularly warfare politics, something could happen you never could predict before. But to do an act like that, to me, would be reckless. Um, until you until you used up any possibility of negotiation. Um, now, th on the other side, just think for a minute, if you were an Iranian or leader, around them they have China, India, um, Russia, United States, Israel, every one of these countries has atomic weaponry. Uh, Pakistan, they're supposedly their great friend, but um, so, in a way, from their point of view is, they want to protect 
themselves. Well, they should, why should all these countries get weapons and we can't? Well, some of their leaders are no goodniks, that's true. But we, why do we have a, you know, a double standard? Why can't the, the world work toward reducing everywhere, and including Israel, which now hasn't even officially recognized to the world that it has this capacity, but everybody knows it does. But, you know, I don't know, you certainly have to use the best methods of negotiations and some sanctions any way you can, but don't, don't uh, mistake the Iranian people from that loudmouth who speaks. The Iranian people as a whole, I, I think, are not behind that. They're repressed. They haven't, their revolution didn't succeed a few years ago. I think we have to help those who are trying to change the situation, have some occupied Tehran movement, etc. Syria, what's happening now in Syria, how does that affect what's going on in Israel? <laughs> Louder again, please. Syria, what do you think about this question Syria was and what's just... going on in Syria? Right, yeah, it's making everybody nervous, but it isn't resolved yet. Um, and I think maybe we, maybe the United States has to decide which side we're on and uh, Help the uh, help one side or the other, I, but it's a very precarious situation. And there's rumors that Syria has atomic weaponry too, and there's a chance that Israel will attempt to to bomb those. So I I, I can't give you a definitive answer, you know. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, regarding Paco, the Native American Indians and the settlers had two totally different disparate cultures. They couldn't even communicate with one another. And I'm also thinking that in the United States we have a composite type of culture. But in other places where you, countries grow up with one nationality, don't you think that Americans have some, we just, sometimes I don't think we can comprehend these people. I, it's like my friends from Europe, and I'm this, I call them continentals, because when I hear them talk about ethnic groups, they don't think like I do. Isn't there a different mindset that we, really have, it it's makes it difficult? Yeah, I think the difference between the Eastern countries and the Western is great. On the other hand, prior to 1948, there were lots of examples of Jews and Palestinians working together, similar enterprises, interacting. I've met them, and they were friends, but since particularly well most you know since the partition and everything that happened there's not much of that and not many Palestinians even could get you know that there are Palestinians who live seven eight miles from Jerusalem and they're not allowed in they haven't been in for 20 years I mean We've heard. Um, uh, but I don't think those cultures are that terribly different you can get humus in both places can't you uh, you, good music in both places, good humor. I, I, I don't think they're that terribly different. I, I, I think association and working together and, you know, there's a camp in Maine every summer, 30 or 40 kids from both sides. They become friends. Well, a lot of them, the pressures of society don't allow them to continue, but occasional ones here and there do. So I, you know, even though it's a different culture and it's more divided by peoples, I don't think it's 100%. Plus, I think those peoples are not that terribly different. And particularly the Arab Jews, they're, almost half of the Israeli population are from the Middle East. 
they have a lot of things in common with the Muslims in the Christian era. If, if they could come to the fore, you know. But it's not any, you know, you have to work on multi-task efforts. Yes, sir. Okay. Here in the city of Chicago, we've had a, we've had a nice mix of ethnic neighborhoods that have assimilated, moved on, taken into it, but it's all been done through a strong central governing authority, even though at times it's been corrupt and, and moved. Why can't, why, why is it so hard to put something like that into the central government of Jerusalem? I mean, you know, the thing is, people want clean streets, they want secure housing, and they want to be able to have freedom of movement. What's so hard about that in Jerusalem? Well, you know, the, the ones now in power want to stay in power. They want to make sure that their people get what they can. And then if oh, they can also give something to the Arabs, they will. But they put their own people first. And uh, so it's somewhat different than a mayor who is the mayor of the whole community. All right. So we have exhausted your question. We will move to our rebuttal. Let's thank our speaker. Let's thank our speaker. Very good. Very good. So, of course. Can somebody take this? Would you please uh, tell me if you are likely to uh, look behind you, Brown, rebut us? Look behind you. You're not putting your hand up. Four, five, six, <laughs> I have so much to say. Seven, five minutes a second. You know that? You will say. I trust you, Dave. All right, five minutes. It, it, what? Will you be able to uh, keep the time there, Um, Tim? Hang on, let me see if I get my, get my cell phone. Yes, I will be able to keep time once I get my cell phone. But that won't be... But uh, we'll start out with Frank and... Uh, right up there, you and Frank. Frank Aguilar. I don't know what you call me. <laughs> this past week it was a suffering week for me. They keep <laughs> reminding me of, uh, <laughs> of the shit that uh, is happening in the world. <laughs> You're celebrating uh, Lent. <laughs> yeah. Um, a friend of mine sent me a, a nice story about a a new preacher, a priest, that uh, he was sent to a little church to to direct that parish and he had to give his first sermon and he's so nervous he hardly, hardly could speak and it was a disaster so he asked the bishop uh, what he can do for the next Sunday and he said well you put a few drops of vodka in the Cutties, and then he will ease you out. And so then he does that, and he gives a wonderful. He's not inhibited at all. And then when he receives a note from the bishop, he says, "Father, I told you to put a few drops of vodka on the water, not a few drops of water on the vodka." He says, "The Virgin Mary is not." That, that little prostitute is just the Virgin Mary. You shouldn't, you shouldn't embrace the uh, statue of the Virgin Mary and kiss her. You just uh, bow in front of her. And the confessionary that is next to the uh, pulpit is not the bathroom. Uh, so also, the person that you approach and you call him uh, you little uh, queer, uh, that was me. I, I wear my uh, uh, bishop clothes uh, when I am wishing that. So the next time, remember, don't drink, don't put too much water, a uh, little vodka in the water. Uh, this, 
this eats me out a little bit, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a sad story that uh, this man from Argentina was named Pope. Um, we in Argentina suffer a lot of years of, of, of dictatorship, which uh, the collaboration of the Catholic Church, uh, the priests were involved in not only uh, selling out the kids, but they were also involved physically in dumping kids in the water in the, in the river from airplanes. Uh, if you don't uh, know about this, go to the Spanish uh, prosecutor Garzon, who was the one who extradited priests from Argentina because they participated in the killing of Spanish citizens by dumping them in the river. So he qualifies for the Pope? He, he qualifies for the Pope, according to the tradition, I guess. Um, I have to uh, thank you, the speaker, because I think it was, uh, in my view, a very, very profound, very good uh, reveal, a, a deep knowledge, and, and a very hopeful message for us all. That's all. Shortly after the uh, new pope uh, took his office and moved into the Vatican chambers, uh, a Higgs boson wandered into the Vatican. <laughs> and um, the pope said, what are you doing here? And the Higgs boson said, without me, you will have no mass. <laughs> Um, a situation similar to what was described by uh, our speaker this evening uh, occurred in the area which is now occupied and called the Balkan countries, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Uh, that area, some 30,000 years ago, was populated by Neanderthals. And uh, the Lithuanians invaded the neighborhood, you know, they, they moved into that area. And as a result of that, uh, there was the same sort of conflict. However, they did interbreed. And the, the result, of course, is Charlie. <laughs> as a result of Petko, also better behaved. Uh, religion really is, it seems to me, to be the determining factor in uh, many of these conflicts. Uh, and they're being exploited by opportunists. That was brought out by our speaker. Those in office want to stay in office and so forth. So they uh, call upon the uh, ignorance of the people to hate the other people. Um, the new pope in obeisance, demanding obeisance, I should say, uh, through the tradition of the Catholic Church, uh, counts on the generation of ethnic and um, cultural hatred in order to maintain the separation that they need in order to keep their control. Thank you. My name is Michael Foley. I got two signs here. I'm going to show them to you and explain them in just a second. I've taken these signs to demonstrations on three separate occasions. And I got good response, and I was surprised. I thought I'd get hostility. Some people said they didn't understand the signs, so I explained it to them, then they understood. <laughs> this sign says, I am killing people in Israel. This sign says, I am killing people in Palestine. And that's what I'm doing right now, this minute, while I'm talking to you. I'm killing people in Israel and in Palestine. These two nations are at war, and my government takes some of my tax money and gives some of my tax money to both countries and says, now go kill each other. And that's what they do. I'm not the guy in either country that's shooting, but I'm the guy that's paying for the bullets. I'm responsible for everything that happens in either one of those countries, because I'm one of the guys that's helping to bankroll it. And I believe what I just said about myself applies to every adult in this country. Because our government's taking all of our tax money and giving it to both countries and helping them run their wars. Now the other thing I want to say, enrages some people, and I'm not saying this to enrage anybody, but I'm saying it because I think it's correct and true. 
I believe that the nation of Israel is a lackey slave colony of the American Empire. And I believe that the nation of Palestine is a lackey slave colony of the American Empire. I believe that it was all set up at, in the late 1940s because of the oil. Oh, yeah. Anytime the international oil companies want to raise the price of oil, they call up the CIA and say, get that war going again. Before you know it, there's one or, who, one or 200 people a week dying in Israel and Palestine. And the oil companies say, oh, we got to raise the price of oil, supply destruction, trouble in the Middle East, blah, blah, blah. The other reason? The oil companies are pumping oil out of the Arab countries and paying them a pittance. Anytime some Arab leader calls up an oil company and says, hey, what's this, man? You're, you're selling oil for 90 bucks a barrel and you're giving us a crummy $2 a barrel. So the same thing. The oil companies call up the CIA and tell them get that war going again. Pretty soon, before you know it, Israelis and Palestinians are killing each other, blowing each other up. And these Arab leaders ain't crying anymore about their crummy two bucks a barrel. They're talking about the effing Israelis this and the effing Israelis that and the effing Israelis everything else. And they forget about the oil. About six months later, the oil companies call up the CIA and say, okay, cut off the war. They go find the Arab leaders and say, we'll give you an extra five cents a barrel. And the Arab leaders say, oh, how happy we are, how happy we are. I think both those nations are being used. The people in both those nations are being used by the empire so the oil companies can make jillions and jillions of dollars. They don't even make trillions anymore to make more than that. That's all I got. Thank you. Tonight's, uh, this, tonight's diatribe reminds me of a discussion I had a few years ago with a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic priest, and a Protestant minister. We were discussing the relevant topic of when does life begin? And uh, the Catholic priest says conception, conception, life begins at conception. And he gave all the relevant arguments. Well, the Protestant minister said, no, birth, birth, life begins at birth. And he gave all the relevant arguments and talked about it. All of a sudden, they turned to the Jewish rabbi and point blankly asked him, when does life begin? He sits and he ponders for a minute and he says, it's simple, when the kids leave and the dog dies. Next. Hi, right. my name is Dan Weinberg. I don't have a joke, I have a poem. Yeah. It's by Pablo Neruda. Okay, this is simple. Power is mute, the trees tell me. And so is profundity, say the roots. And purity too, says the grain. No tree ever said, I am the tallest. No root ever said, I came from deeper down. No, I don't. And bread never said, what is better than bread? <laughs> and my poem is, same subject. The library never says, see how smart I am? The orchestra hall never says, see how good I sound? The peacock never says, look how beautiful I am. Knowledge cannot be shown. Music can never be seen. Beauty comes from deep inside. Thank you. My wife has a short song she wants to sing. <laughs> Oh, 
This song I try to introduce from Russia. It's in Russian language. Всю ночь name of the song Bridges. You know, like bridges, like walking in the bridge. Bridges. Всю ночь над городом не на Всю ночь колдует темнота. Остановилась где-то счастье у разведенного моста. Мосты встают ночной преградой, холодным отблеском огня. Мосты, мосты, зачем вам надо с любимым разлучать меня? Ну разве ночь над миром властна? Спешит заря, зовет мечта, и ты сумей дождаться счастья у разведенного моста. Мечта придет и счастье будет, но к ним дорога непроста. Как часто вспять уходят люди от разведенного моста. Мосты встают ночной преградой в холодных облесках огня. Мосты, мосты, зачем вам надо? С любимым разлучать меня, но разве ночь над миром властна? Спешит заря, зовет мечта, но ты сумей дождаться счастья у разведенного моста. I don't get it. It's about love. It's love. I don't get it. Like many of the people here, I have skin in the game. My ass is on the line whether I'm in Chicago or Jerusalem. I've heard and read a lot. I've heard and read a lot of peace plans. Never, ever once have I read or heard that there is some kind of shortage of peace plans that we don't have enough and we need more to choose from. I was hoping to get some ideas or clues about something to do to advance peace. And I haven't heard any yet. Not here tonight. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't care about lists and, and, and theories and platonic ideals. I care about people not killing each other. The public opinion polls very consistently report the same thing. Two-thirds of the Israelis want peace. They just want to live. Two-thirds of the Palestinians want peace. They just want to live. But there are loonies. Personally, I see the two sides as the peaceable and the loony. And some of the loonies are Jews, and some of the loonies are Muslims, and I assume that a few of the loonies are Christians, although I haven't really chased it down. But most people just want to live their lives. And I really would like suggestions about how I possibly might help, but there haven't been any here. I'd like to also address a couple of the other comments. Somebody talked about invasion. Jews lived in Hebron continuously for well over 3,000 years until they were driven out by the pogroms of the 1920s and 30s. So when you're talking about invasion, you, you, it would help if you were just a little bit better informed first. Uh, incidentally, I, I, I thought it was ironic that at the bottom of this flyer, there's the list of Cyprus, Ireland, Malaysia, South Africa. Cyprus and Ireland and Malaysia and South Africa and Palestine and India 
were all partitioned by the retreating British colonialists. There, it, it, it's, there, there are too many cases to be a coincidence. Uh, that's not tonight's topic. I, I won't go any further, but, but just sticking the list in here um, doesn't, doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, a final comment about Iran. Anybody who tells you flatly what's going on in Iran or what's going on with the government in Iran is either a liar or a fool. The government of Iran is one of the most opaque governments in the world. There is a supreme leader. His title is supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. Ayatollah Khamenei has very emphatically issued a very serious, solemn religious edict that says that nuclear weapons are utterly forbidden. Meanwhile, there's a clown whose job is to go around shooting off his mouth and making trouble. Ahmadinejad is probably much better known than Khamenei, but um, he doesn't have any power. He doesn't tell the army what to do. He doesn't tell the scientists what to do. And in addition, his term of office that he was elected to is nearly over. He's history. So. I, I, I don't know whether or not Iran is developing nuclear weapons, but nobody outside of Iran knows for sure. And the consensus in the actual intelligence communities is that no, Iran is not developing nuclear weapons. But again, anybody who absolutely tells you they do know, and this is the fact, is either a liar or a fool. Thank you. I'm not going to get into that either, except to say that that seems to be an especially appropriate topic considering that tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> a happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. Not friends. my fault. <laughs> uh, number two, not being equipped to discuss Michael Foley's particular type of geopolitics. I'm not going to get into all that. Instead, I'm going to deal with other, other, other issues instead. Uh, first of all, a two-state solution is, in my view, the only viable one. The Jews have tried before living in a Muslim-dominated country with a largely Muslim population, and we wind up paying a tax in order to continue to worship as Jews. Uh, that isn't going to cut it, friends. Um, a two-state solution is the only answer, uh, and one without a Palestinian right of return. Uh, number two, I think that APAC, while well, I may not agree with everything that it says or does, I think that's a perfectly proper organization that's engaged in perfectly proper business. If the Palestinians and their friends disagree, fine. They're at liberty to start up their own organization that does with Congress what APAC does, period, end of story. Um, Bay Pardon? They're going to try to do that too. That's their privilege. This is a, they have that constitutional right. Secondly, it is my understanding that while Israel was at one time a largely Ashkenazic dominated state, that changed in the 1970s following the immigration of all the Jews from Arab speaking countries and elsewhere. And so now it is largely a Sephardic dominated state uh, with the biggest populations and then the biggest people voting blacks coming from Jews of Arab, of Arab descent. And that's when Israel became more conservative as a result. Um, with regard to the charge that was made about uh, the Israelis, or the Jews rather, are invaders, that's, that's a crock of horseshit, plain and simple. In fact, first of all, the claim of the Jews to the homeland is, is, is 2,000 years old, at least. That's number one. And I reject the assertions of certain atheists in the room who are not Jewish who deny the, the Jewish claim. That's number one. Number two, when, when during the Second World War and before, when Jews started to buy land there, they had every right to do that 
And I don't, sorry, I don't think that the Palestinians, despite their claims to the contrary later, will unduly taken advantage of. Microphone. Hang on a second, I'm glancing at my notes here. And the examples that, and in particular, the biggest offender in that regard is well-known journalist Helen Thomas. And I used to be a big admirer of Helen Thomas, particularly when she used to take on Richard Nixon back when I was in high school. And I thought, frankly, that he deserved it, too. But if Helen Thomas in this day and age thinks that the Jews should olive Israel, well, as I said to Charlie earlier, like, uh, when is she moving back to Lebanon? Why doesn't she apply her own logic here in the United States? The only difference is that we bought that land fair and square from the Palestinians. Here in the United States, the American settlers just moved in and took the land from the Indians, plain and simple. Um, with regard to the comments that were made about Use the, the mic. About, I'm doing my best. <laughs> With regard to the comments that were made about my grandparent or about Lithuania, well, my own grandparents hailed from there, and my grandmother in particular, her sister, my great aunt, well, they considered themselves part of the local culture, that is, until the revolution came and they had to leave. As for my great Lithuania, you're playing with no, my, great, my grandmother and her sister came here, and they, and they lived there for the rest of their lives. Um, finally, with regards to the comments that were made about the rockets and so on, well, it's awful easy to say, well, the Israelis were horrible to fire all these rockets into, into Gaza and so on, forgetting that it was the people in Gaza who fired first. That's number one. And if, the, if, if the Israelis fire back, then just what was it the people in Gaza expected would happen? What was it they thought would happen when, when they do something that? War should never be started lightly. And as General Sherman once said, war is hell and you cannot refine it to anything else. Yes. Well, before I uh, comment on tonight's speech, of course, there was another important event that took place this week, Habe Mus Papam. Uh, there is a new pope. And I take note of what great extent uh, the, the extreme measures the Catholic Church will take to try and bring some of their lost souls back into the fold. He should have been named Ringo. But uh, in any case, uh, on that note, regardless of what they do in Rome, Frank, you will always be Francisco the first from Argentina to everybody. In the <laughs> and on a serious note, there is a lot of debate going on as to what role uh, the Cardinal played back during the bad old days of the Dirty War. Some people say he, he participated and he collaborated. Some people said he didn't. Uh, I hope more information will come out on this as time goes on. I think it'd be great if there were someone willing to take the topic on uh, in an objective way to have a session here at the college about that because I think it's kind of an important issue. Of course, they're carrying on a tradition uh, Ratzinger was a member of the Hitler Jugend. Pius XII collaborated with the Nazis, so you know uh, and the Pope. The, the Popes have always collaborated with the the powers that be, whether they were good guys or bad guys. So uh, nothing, nothing new there. Regarding this evening's talk, wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. You gave a nice summary of a lot of the issues, some of which we knew about, and some things I did not know, uh, and uh, what. My comment on that, I guess, is there's just so much problem. Uh, this is a war that could go on for hundreds of years, the way it did in, in, in Northern Ireland, for example. That's, that went on for years and years and years, for centuries in one form or another. Could happen here, too. Now we have a, a peace in Ireland. But how, you know, is it permanent or is it temporary? We don't know. When, when the roots of the problem are too deep, 
uh, sometimes we just have to look for a totally different solution, a totally different geographic solution. And I'm not the first even at this podium to suggest this, but perhaps uh, we should uh, uh, Take the whole problem. With my, my, my solution would be to take the take all of Israel, part of Lebanon, part of Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, and make them an international territory, governed in some way by an international group, and give Israel uh, a, a larger, better piece of land to work with. Uh, it was proposed, in fact, I hear after World War II that they should get part of Germany because, after all, Germany is the one that caused the Holocaust. That went away. That went away because probably of political reasons at the time. We were, we were friendlier with the Germans even though we had been at war with them. Uh, looked at them more as long-term friends than we did, let's say, uh, the people in, in Palestine or anywhere in the Middle East. Uh, another member of the group, uh, a, few, a year or two ago, Jeff Schrammick, some of you know him, suggested that we, that we give uh, the Jews Montana, if they'll give up Israel over there. My, my answer to that is that the Jews are way too smart to take Montana as trade for Israel. And uh, my, my suggestion would be maybe part of, part of Texas. So they'll have seaports, they'll have climate that's similar to the current Israel. Uh, maybe even a little bit of oil thrown in. Uh, anyway, I, I think that uh, a, a, a radical solution uh, may, be, may be required there. I do agree with the speaker that a conflagration is possible over this little piece of land and the fighting that's going on there could conceivably turn into a worldwide, war, worldwide nuclear war, uh, primarily because of course there's such a close relationship between Israel and the United States. The United States will, will support Israel to the point of possibly having such a thing. And, and there are a lot of scenarios. I, I'm not going to sit here and paint any of them tonight. It takes too long. But it is a very serious problem, not just for the people over there, but for the entire world. Uh, with regard to, uh, Sorry, uh, to David Zucker's comments, I'm, I'm not sure all the land was paid for, but maybe it was. I don't know the, 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 the actual history of that. And as far as buying land and being able to create a new country, of course, people have done it before, but how would we feel if, if uh, a large number of people, uh, uh, who knows, let's say Palestinians, were to come in and buy up most of Chicago and then say they want to start their own country? We, we probably have a question about that. And we fought a civil war uh, over who could, uh, who could take part of a country and call it something else. Uh, it's it's a very it's a very difficult problem. We have to we have to start out by admitting that. Uh, and finishing up, as far as Iran, uh, while I admit it could be a very serious problem for Iran, for all of us, uh, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, I have to say, if I were the Iranian leadership, I would certainly be seeking a nuclear weapon. Uh, Henry Bienen, former president of Northwestern University, and and a and an expert, in, particularly in the Soviet area, uh, once said at a uh, panel that he was on that uh, if you don't have nuclear weapons, you don't sit at the table. And there is some truth to that. If you want to really be any kind of world power, you have to have nuclear weapons. And particularly, as our speaker pointed out, Iran is in a very difficult neighborhood. A lot of people who, who are dangerous to them, uh, they may be dangerous to begin with, but. Uh, uh, there are people who are dangerous countries that are dangerous to them, most importantly the United States. The United States has attacked many countries in, in recent times and uh, the, uh, the, however, the United States, however, has not yet attacked any nuclear powers. And therefore, uh, I can understand they're wanting it and I would say that they, uh, there is no particular reason that they're not entitled to having it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, okay. Well, first of all, first of all, it's, it's not precisely true that the United States has never attacked a nuclear power. Um, Iran, uh, excuse me, Pakistan has nuclear weapons, but that hasn't stopped us from uh, bombing parts of Pakistan. Uh, now, um, now, David Zucker brought up a real interesting point. I think somebody else did too about British colonialism. Is there a connection? You know, and tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. I might as well. I, in my opinion, 
there is a connection between between the partition of Ireland and the proposed partition of um, of Israel. Now, both Ireland and Palestine, as it was back called back in the old days, were part of the British Empire. Um, the Irish started fighting for their independence, and eventually the British, uh, of course, the Protestants who lived in, in Ireland, mostly in the north, um, didn't uh, wanted to stay in the United Kingdom, and so the British proposed, well, let's kind of, let's partition Ireland, so we get a, we get a Irish free state in the south, the present Republic of Ireland, and we get the Northern Ireland, the predominantly Protestant, so we, we split it into predominantly Catholic and predominantly Protestant areas, and that way at least the Brits got to hold on to at least part of Ireland. Um, and then in the 1930s, the British were the first to, to propose the two-state solution for Palestine, um, which they called the Partition Plan, uh, which would have split it into, um, into a, a Jewish section, smaller than Israel today, an Arab section, and, and, and a third section which would be international. And then, of course, in the 40s, the British came up with the solution to the India problem, partition again, which led to both two states, India and Pakistan, and, um, and, and both of them nuclear armed and ready to go to war with each other. Now, um, so, so, there, so it's not a coincidence. Now, we've heard a lot of proposed solutions to the Israeli-Palestinian problem tonight, but in my opinion, all of this discussion is purely academic. It's, um, frankly, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Now, let me tell you why. First of all, the Israeli government is not going to implement any solution that they view as compromising their security. They're going to take the position that our security is number one priority, outranking everything. Now, second, people, you know, it's happened many times before. The British tried to mediate back in the 30s. Um, the United Nations got into the act in 1947. And now the United States tries to do this thing with, with um, well, first with, with Oslo, Camp David, Taba, uh, and then the so-called roadmap to peace during the Bush era. None of it accomplished uh, very much. Uh, none of it report. None of it really it accomplished things, but none of it resolved the conflict. The fact, what's happened is that the United States may pretend to be a neutral arbiter, but the truth is that the United States uh, always sides with Israel. Uh, now, as for the United Nations, the United Nations can protest against this action or that action by Israel as much as they want, but the United Nations is completely impotent. It has no power to enforce its statements. Uh, finally, there's the issue of you know, the Palestinians themselves. Uh, as has already been brought up, there's no unity among the Palestinians. You've got the Palestinian Authority, which is, has international recognition, but does not have the support of most Palestinians. Then you've got Hamas, which actually is supported by the Palestinians, but, um, but is, is obviously very much rejected as a partner by the United States and also by Israel. And then, um, and then you've got these other groups that are more radical than Hamas. They're total rejectionists. That want to are not going to are not going to quit fighting until Israel's wiped off the map, which is probably not going to happen. So, um, so uh, unless uh, unless Iran fires a nuclear weapon into Israel, that would uh, wipe them off the map. Uh, now, the, then there's a, somebody brought up the question is that that. And maybe it was Mike Foley about uh, the U.S. supporting Israel because of uh, oil. Well, Israel hasn't got any oil supply right now, and, yeah. and, and so I think I think if, if we were our number one concern was oil, I think we'd probably side with the Palestinians because uh, because the Arabs have got a heck of a lot more oil than Israel, and uh, and the 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 Arab nations tend to be more sympathetic to the Palestinians because they too are Arabs. Uh, now on the question of you know, it's, I think this uh, gentleman here said the Israelis want peace and the Palestinians want peace. Yeah, they all want peace on their own terms. And, well, you know, but so, uh, and since their own terms disagree, they're not going to have peace. They're going to keep fighting. Now, I just want to, so, now I just want to uh, uh, bring up uh, the whole, the Gaza conflict and the business of who's, who's to blame for rockets fired from one side to the other. Now, First of all, now it is a fact that obviously Israel is is a much stronger country than, than Hamas controlling the tiny little Gaza Strait that's fired a lot more rockets. Uh, however, to blame, to say, well, it's all Hamas's fault because they started shooting rockets first is a is a vast oversimplification. Um, the reason the reason they started doing that was retaliation because Israel closed the border and, and put a siege on Gaza. Now, a siege is an act of war. 
Uh, now, the reason Israel put the siege on Gaza is because earlier, uh, finally bowing to pressure from Hamas, uh, the Palestinian Authority, which was still had, had Fatah as its only political party, had finally agreed to allow Hamas to participate in Palestinian elections. And much to their surprise, Hamas won! Well, this is awful. The wrong guys won. I mean, you can't have a... How can you have an election when the wrong side wins? So the, the United States... The United States said, we're never recognize a government led by Hamas. Israel agreed. And, and so, so they ordered the Palestinian Authority to suppress Hamas and not let him take office. And they were successful in the West Bank, but in Gaza, Hamas seized power. And Israel retaliated by throwing a siege around the Gaza Strip. And, uh, and then Hamas retaliated against them by firing rockets. And then Israel retaliated with the famous Operation Path Lead. And I'm getting, I'm getting some throat cutting symbols uh, from, uh, from our cameraman here. So I guess I better quit. And I see that I share uh, I'll share uh, uh, Dan's pessimism. Don't think that uh, all those ideas are, um, are feasible right now, practical. And here are some of the um, the main the main barriers. First of all, politics, politicians. If we could get all the politicians out of the picture, both in Israel, Palestine, and in the United States, the lobbies that Greece, APEC, um, then uh, maybe, maybe we have some hope. But that is not gonna happen. We are, uh, the, the whole affairs is ruled not by the wish of people, but by politicians. Um, number two is going back to history and religion, uh, the religion and the entitlement, and who was there first, David, uh, we are not in agreement, it's not the black and white, and that's why I'm saying I think it's useless to go back to history. I mean, the Hebrews were, uh, when the Hebrews really came to Canaan as a nomad tribe from Egypt, Canaan was populated. So what happened? I mean, they fought the Amaleks and all that for the monotheistic God and got what they were not entitled to. But you see, it's, it's useless. I think they, they, what would be more practical would be to start with the 67 uh, boundaries, borders, because their invasion was uh, effect. Uh, and the settlers, <laughs> that's a fact. We don't need them. Most of we. Uh, my solution, my personal solution, was to move from the Mid East to the Midwest. <laughs> but uh, uh. but when I talk about Israel, um, the 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 the, uh, the settlements will sell certainly a big aggravation, putting facts on the map as as bullies. This was not anymore to give a shelter or asylum to Holocaust refugees, which was a very justified uh, reason at the time, especially since Palestine at that time was not a state. It was a British mandate. Uh, and I agree with you about the, uh, <laughs> the Brits. Um, so uh, we have to just start without going back to who started, who was there first, who is entitled, whose God gave and promised to whom. This is all useless, unproductive, divisive. Uh, now, is it going to happen? Not, I don't think, in my lifetime. Um, and uh, it is irrational, and, and my conclusion is that our species is hopeless and irrational, and. Brain transplant, is that the solution? I don't know. <laughs> Good evening. I, uh, back in the um, 70s, I used to think that the uh, news reporting the, uh, the uh, Israeli conflict over there sounded very sexual. The uh, news commentator would say, the other day, uh, 
Israel penetrated Lebanon's lower regions very deeply and uh, Lebanon has petitioned to the UN asking them to bring pressure on Israel saying that they cannot withstand this much penetration and that to please withdraw. Uh, Israel, however, having brought matters to a climax, is expected any day to pull out. Well, that was the way it sounded to me. Anyway, back in the 1970s, I used to work with a group called Friends of Israel with a gentleman named Harold Eisenberg and another gentleman named Milton Lampert. Uh, and we used to put up dances at the Belmont Hotel and at the Blair House and other such places. Uh, and we used to raise money for Mogan David Adam so that ambulances could be sent to Israel. It's very sad to, um, for, for me to have to mention that because the um, Red Cross would not involve themselves in Israel. Be why? Probably because they are a Christian organization and they wouldn't do anything where there were Jews. So Israel had to provide their own version of the Red Cross, which is Mogan David Adam. I was at a party at the Calumet Harbor where we saw off a, um, a big ship with a large number of ambulances that were being sent to Mogan David Adam, to Israel. And uh, this, um, these ambulances did not serve only the Jews, but the Israeli Red Cross, or Mogan David Adam as it were, they help anybody in that region whether they're Arab, Palestinian, Jewish, or whatever. So uh, I want I want to also touch on the fact that the gentleman that said about Texas uh, being offered to the Jews if they would give up Israel, uh, I want to mention that uh, a man named Lord Bolfar offered uh, to uh, Benjamin Disraeli, wanted to know if there was anything England could do for him since he had done so very much for Israel. And uh, Benjamin Disraeli said, yes, you can give Israel back to my people. And uh, Lord Bolfar said, well, you know, that's so mired in all, all that conflict and, and everything. There are so, so many places in the empire that are lush. Couldn't Israel, couldn't your people accept a play, another place? And Benjamin Disraeli, and Benjamin Disraeli said, you know, London has terrible weather and fog and everything. Wouldn't there be a better place for English people to go to instead of England? And Lord Bullfar said, but we have England, you don't have Israel. To which Benjamin Disraeli said, we had Israel when England was a marsh. So you see, no matter what place would ever be offered to Israel if they would give up Israel, it ain't ever gonna happen. The Jews are always gonna want Israel. And so with that, I close. Good. Gosh, everybody who's come up here seems to know so many facts about the uh, Israel-Palestinian history. Uh, I can't be fooled. <laughs> um, and they've all been adding things. So I uh, <clears throat> haven't really made a study of it, um, but um, uh, I got a little interested in it um, uh, when I was uh, researching uh, uh, my play on the Holocaust, and I met one of my good friends, uh, Bell Kerman, um, when I was doing that. Um, and uh, we were uh, co-producing a play in 1996 uh, at uh, Red Orchid Theater, theater and uh, uh, 
around that time, uh, she invited me to come to a, uh, it was like a get-together between uh, Jews, uh, some uh, Israelis, I guess, were attending, uh, some Palestinians were attending. It was some kind of a thing to try and have it like a joint friendship uh, uh, enterprise or something of that nature. And so I met some of the people involved and got the impression that, well, maybe these, this thing is uh, going to crack here. I mean, maybe there's going to be some kind of an explosion of friendship. <laughs> that was in 96. Um, and it uh, came along 1999, 2000, I guess, and it looked like uh, the negotiations uh, that Clinton was promoting uh, were going to work. Uh, uh, that was kind of very briefly uh, gone over, if at all, by the speaker. Uh, the, but the history has been so long and uh, drawn out and so many things happening, as has been pointed out. Uh, one fact, one uh, piece of history leads to another. I mean, there's been a, there was a big thing in the press that uh, uh, Arafat uh, supposedly was given this, this terrific offer and, uh, and he walked away from it and so it really was his fault. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of people uh, caught up on that and um, uh, really um, uh, people that had maybe been even handed, uh, and, and including me, maybe fall, fall for that. It, it was true, maybe it wasn't, and kind of blame the Palestinians more uh, since the year 2000 because of, uh, of leaving that offer on the table and walking away from it. Um, it, had, it was very complicated, it had to do with uh, some of the settlements I think were going to be dismantled, I mean, but not all of them. I mean, it was something uh, very difficult to tell unless you were into the details at that time. And I have pondered the situation. I, it was amazed, I was amazed to, to hear about from the speaker. And I do want to uh, say that I extremely appreciate the scholarship and the uh, amount of detail that uh, he went into uh, and the bibliography, which if I had a huge amount of time on my hands, I could go through all the, of the books and uh, see. But uh, in him briefly going over, I, I, I remember that uh, I had, it occurred to me uh, um, a possible solution was uh, to have uh, three uh, states. One would be uh, fanatic Palestinians, fanatic Israelis, and, and people in the middle of the road who voted to be part of a mixed state. I, I just, I, I remember that that had occurred to me. I never wrote it down or anything or proposed it, but uh, that seems to have been something that he discussed. Uh, uh, but uh, I thought um, that you'd have to have like um, uh, really strict controls over that because uh, I, it immediately occurred to me that Palestinians and Jews who were fanatics who tried to game the system by lying that they were middle of the road, reasonable people, and tried to get into the third state, the, the middle of the road state, to try and screw it up, and, you know, to make sure that it wouldn't end up being a solution. So, so, there, so then I conceived that, uh, well, you'd have to have people take lie detector tests, they'd have to go through psychological evaluations to make sure, I mean, there'd have to be a lot of... Uh, 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 things going on there to make sure that that third state that would be a trial state to see if Jews and Palestinians could live together uh, That you'd have to screen the people very carefully to get into that. So uh, The difficulties are immense. They still are um, But um, I do have some hope that uh, possibly in Obama's second term That now that he doesn't have to worry about being re-elected anymore um, That he might actually exert himself. It's uh, it uh, seems like he has been uh, um, not as uh, forthcoming on his issue as uh, many of us in the uh, liberal progressive uh, community had hoped, uh, but uh, we do hope that he will uh, push for a solution in the next four years. Thanks. I know last time I told a joke, but in all seriousness, I do believe that a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is possible. And the reason I state that is if you look at the world uh, we're seeing right now on the internet, particularly something called HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is a, an agreement of standards for interoperability of computers to work with, uh, with one another, which basically means I could go from my home computer, log into a Palestinian website, log into an Israeli website, log into the Hamas website, and they all use the same communication protocols. And that was an agreed upon standards that has propagated throughout the world. The same thing with broadcast and other things. I can sit home now and through various types of agreements and 
open standards around the web, I can catch the Israeli Broadcast Authority. I can get Al Jazeera. I can get a lot of these other things. And it's all done through a common meeting of standards that was agreed to by, of all things, the Consumer Electronics Association. Many other agreements exist on the movement of money and flows and banking. And personally, I think the reason why we haven't seen peace yet is because the politicians don't really want peace. War for them is profitable. The Israelis have a scapegoat that they can blame the Palestinians for all their problems and not look at domestic problems that they have. The Palestinians have a common, common scapegoat that they can look at and blame the Israelis for all their problems and not look at their own social programs. And not to mention the security people that come up, not to mention everything else. It is simply my contention that Yes, most people want peace, but there are too many entrenched powers that profit from the war going on right now. And, 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 and you know, you might want to think about it to, to, be, to, to somebody like me who looks at it. You know, we have a, a civil society here in the United States. We have an agreed upon set of standards that we all ad ad adhere to. And I think those standards are universal values. And personally, I think that most people in the world really want, you know, things like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. And Mike, I'll say it if I, any empire that has those values behind it is an empire that I can support. So let's just say I'd rather see Pax Americana than something else. Thank you. thank our speaker again. I think you have your head and your heart in the right place. And I think he did give us an outline of the options or the choices. He's delineated them and he's given research which you can pursue further if you want additional information to explore each of those options. It's a very logical approach. Uh, you can choose among those on the list. Therefore, I got my three dollars worth. The thing I will say, though, regarding PECO, is that you're lacking in process or procedures. You told me you made some advances to the United Nations Association, things like that. I, I, I was reflecting on conflict resolution that I deal with in the labor community. We have things called ADR, this Alternative Dispute Resolution. We do it every day. We have grievance procedures and things like that. But I think the area you're talking about, sir, Howard, is the process, I mean, the process that I engage in is the process of negotiations. And I think you're negotiating towards a treaty in the affairs of two countries or more countries. You negotiate a treaty. Now, you negotiate towards agreement by the parties. Now, what happens sometimes, if the parties cannot agree, either one of them, at least that I deal with, can declare impasse, which I have done on occasion. And when I declare impasse, that means you bring in a third party mediator. And even in our context, the, me the, the two parties are actually even separated in different rooms and do not meet. Only the mediator goes from one party to the other. Now they do have some authority to try to see that there's some movement is the term that's used. Otherwise they will impose a decision on you. And as a last recourse, if this process fails, I have the option of going to what is called the impasses panel to make a decision. We generally try to avoid that because, as Joe would know, when you go to these decisions, you very often end up with less than you would get through the process of negotiations. And that's what I think your press, I'd like to add that to your PECO in some fashion, that you have a procedure for implementation in here. Anyhow, that's all I had to add. Actually, I thank you very much. I. Uh, I think you gave an outside line of the situation there. 
And I so, will say one last thing, though, regarding it. I'm going to bring this back to negotiations. I've heard some assertions here made at this microphone about this situation. And I'm going to bring you back to my very first negotiations. I was presenting this A and B and C. And my mentor, Mike, who was training me, after a while said, Charles, you have done an excellent job. However, we have to start negotiation. Now, you can hold on to your assertions, or you can be like me, where he put his arm to me on the side and said, you better start negotiating. The choice is yours on this situation. You can harbor these things as long as you want, but you're never going to achieve agreement. Anyhow, thank you very much. Charles, the two sides do. Well, to agree I have to accept the, the negotiation. Convert them all to United Methodism. <laughs> <laughs> of course, United Methodists have a few disagreements among themselves. And sometimes they're not always too nice to each other. Uh, uh, particularly those who are, uh, let's see, our, our, our Southeastern Conference uh, tend to think that it would be too bad if anybody who was homosexual uh, got ordained. Uh, in fact, that is the official uh, position of the, the uh, United Methodist Church, but we do have a number of homosexual uh, uh, pastors. Uh, and uh, uh, we, you know, somehow they, they continue to uh, collect uh, um, the, uh, the benefits of uh, the insurance system of pastors and the uh, United Methodist Connection and uh, it, all sorts of oddities persist, but, you know, well, of course, I'm in the position of being a uh, uh, by baptism and uh, association and frequent communion, uh, an Anglican, an Episcopalian. Uh, so I uh, have to contribute to uh, friends of the uh, Diocese of Jerusalem, uh, which is doing a good ministry. In, uh, in Israel, Palestine, uh, supporting hospitals and schools that uh, uh, have a Jewish and uh, Muslim and uh, Christian uh, students uh, and teachers. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they can be helpful. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of making peace. And if you study the ways of making peace, I think that the more you study it, uh, the more likely you are uh, to come up with some reconciliations and some peace. Look, making friends is not always possible, but it, it, there are ways of making friends, of being a friend, and uh, I'm glad to see that our speaker has been looking into it, and I think that uh, the rest of us have to, too. Uh, I, the fatalism of saying, oh, well, I mean, it, for centuries, there was the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. 
Well, the Jews and the Israelis were not fighting each other. They weren't the same. But they had a common heritage and they produced uh, a, uh, a number of, of people with much in common. Um, so, and having much in common, uh, unfortunately, uh, they uh, in uh, in Israel today uh, they they uh, settled on having a land together, uh, which was uh, largely taken from uh, uh, the other occupants of that land by war, and that's a sad thing. Uh, we have to do something about the people who have been evicted, and we have to uh, make sure that the Israelis are not also evicted. Uh, you got to pray for people. You got to be concerned. Oh, yeah, pray. So we will. See, Let's pray, pray. Yeah, all right. Pray. Yeah. Speaker gets the last word. Thank you. That's all I have for. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody who made comments, whether they particularly liked what I said or didn't. But uh, that's how you learn, you know. That's how the process uh, develops. But I just want to mention that um, about 125 years ago, uh, a Viennese a playwright, a very assimilated Jew who had a very little Jewish background, uh, became aware of what was happening in Europe, which ended up, you know, with, to be honest, with the Holocaust. But, and he, be, he was a visionary. And he said, if you will it, it's no dream. And it was 125 years ago, but in about 70 years, his dream came to fruition. The, the state of Israel was created, and it was he, he had tremendous energy. He was a young man when he did this, uh, but he went around to all the uh, leaders of the various countries. All kinds of ideas were proposed: Madagascar, Uganda, South America. He stuck to he examined them all. As a matter of fact, at one point he would have been willing to accept. A different land, but then he, Max Nordau and others, said no, and he he developed and shaped. But he had the goal of a homeland, and eventually it got focused on only you know Israel, and they achieved it. You know, 75 years. Well, I think some of us have a dream now too. Martin Luther King did, and I think we can, if we will it. I think we can have a world in which both homelands will exist and we'll have peace in the Middle East and in the Holy Land. But how is that going to come about? It's going to come about by a worldwide movement toward this. And if those of us want to be part of this movement, let's join it and give our strength to it. Let's will this dream of a united world and a united holy land where people are different but yet they're unified and I think you know what can you do I, what I was outlining today was I don't think that we've reached the answer yet I'm saying let's keep studying till we find the answer meanwhile do things also get to know some Muslims get to know some Jews if you don't know them or Christians, and if you if you're inclined toward writing things, write a proposal, 
send it to the newspapers, argue with other people. If we, if we take a part in this, we might have a part in history. Now, if you want a part, I want a part in history. I, the college I went to, I know this sounds sort of corny, but the motto of the college is, be ashamed to die until you've won at least one victory for humanity. I, I'm 80 years old in the next month, uh, May, but I want to do something before I leave the planet, and I think we all could, and let's work together on it. I'm inviting you, I'm, we're starting this organization, PACO. I'd like some help on it. I'd like to get it incorporated. I'd like to get people working. I'd like to get funding. And there are other people to line, you know, link up with around the world. So I'd like some help on this. And let's, let's have a, a say in history and not just let history develop without us having a part in it. And the, the stakes are, are very great. This isn't a little thing. This might determine the future of the world, really. Where else could the world blow up other than the Middle East? So uh, thanks again. And uh, whether it's Shalom, Salam, or Paco, which means peace in Esperanto, or any, probably you know some other languages, let's work toward it. And let's get there. Thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you soon again. All right. Ron, is it over? Wow, it's like my birthday. Yeah, it's early.